Town Council reports and correspondence. Nope. I have one item. We received a letter from Robert Ayotte, who is president of the Fort Williams Foundation, thanking us for our matching gift of $75,000, making possible the construction of the Lighthouse View at Fort Williams Park. Okay. Uh, Finance Committee report, please. Uh, Jessica, we have uh, quite a few items on today's agenda, so I'm going to uh, def defer. Quite a few financial items. Yes, I, I think we'll defer to those items, uh, especially the discussion on TIF. So. All right, thank you, Council Walsh. And now an opportunity for citizens to discuss items that are not on tonight's agenda, and I do believe we have. Yes, thank you. Good evening, I'm uh, Barbara Powers, and back in December you uh, appointed me, along with six other Cape residents, to the 250th Anniversary Celebration Committee and gave us a charge of providing leadership in celebrating the 250th anniversary of the incorporation of Cape Elizabeth, which occurred on November 1 of 1765. We've been meeting monthly since um, February and have a lot of ideas already kicking around and some really exciting partnerships. And before you read about uh, it from our first official press release in the Courier, which will be coming up in a couple of weeks, Elizabeth Brogan, the editor, nicely granted us a chance to foreshadow some of the events. I thought I'd come give you a copy of the press release, talk about a couple of things. It's going to speak about this blue banner that's behind you because we've decided to make it as much as possible a year-long celebration beginning in November 1 of this year. So let me pass this out for you. We added, uh, well we started with um, Catherine Adams, Jane Beckwith, Carol Ann Jordan, Norman Jordan, Stephanie Corrupt, Darren McClellan, and me, and Carrie Dyer later asked if she could be added. She's a manager at In By The Sea. And so we decided, with Carrie's uh, generous support, to offer sort of a bookended year, beginning with a very festive open house for all Cape Elizabeth residents at In By The Sea, and ending with a ticketed gala dinner event there is what the uh, preliminary plans are looking like, actually on November 1st. In between, already in the works are real exciting partnerships with the Fort Williams Foundation, with sort of our capstone project being uh, right now called A Night at the Light, which brings Portland Symphony back to Fort Williams next summer, hopefully in late August. We clearly have steps to go through for all that to happen, but we have some very energetic members of the Fort Williams Foundation, including Bob and others. Uh, meeting with representatives from our committee, and we're very excited about that possibility. We're looking to partner with a historical society and series of discussions and presentations and bus tours and docent-led tours at various sites. Uh, the elementary school has already received a, an important CEIF grant, which will allow them to bring in the storytelling project, which will bring Gretchen Berg back to Cape Elizabeth, who I worked with many years ago, in, uh, and they'll be doing physical theater around the history of Cape. Uh, as well as a permanent mural installation showing historic sites then and now. That will be happening during the school year. Uh, and uh, the other various events that are mentioned in this press release. But I, before you read about this in the Courier, I thought you might like to hear about it directly from your chair. So thanks for letting me speak. Are there any questions? We plan to be back to you in September with a lot more details about the uh, symphony proposal. Uh, as you'll need to weigh in on that with us as well, but that is generating a lot of excitement. Oh, and we also plan to have banners through the middle of town featuring this logo as well as three others that depict other important historic uh, and cultural uh, icons of Cape Elizabeth. So, anything else? Well, thank you. Um, thank you. It's very exciting that we do have a 250 year anniversary coming up. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, this committee has tremendous ideas. I've been following their minutes and they have, they really do, as Barbara has been telling us, have some very exciting ideas. Thank you. And uh, so we thank you and we will stay tuned. Thank you. The banner first appeared at the um, uh,
Cape Elizabeth Land Trust event last night. It will be back at Beach to Beacon, and Mr. McGovern has graciously offered to have it displayed in the offices. We really want people to start to think about what's coming next year. Thank you. Thank you very much. And could we please have the town manager's monthly report? Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman Sullivan. A couple of things. First, I wanted to mention uh, that Jackie Coy, our deputy town clerk, will be retiring on August 1. Uh, she, she's been with us for a long time. She was a, a tax clerk for many years. Uh, she also was our town clerk for a little bit, a little bit of time, and she decided that she really didn't like that and wanted to go to go back to being the deputy. But uh, she'll be sorely missed, and we appreciate uh, all the all that she's done for the community over the years. And uh, I think she's looking forward to her retirement. So, wanted to congratulate her on that and thank her as well for all that she's done for the community. Uh, secondly, I did want to mention the passing of uh, Richard D. Hughes. Uh, some of you may have known uh, Dick Hughes. He was a longtime resident here of Cape Elizabeth. In fact, lived in a couple of different homes uh, while they lived here. Uh, he, back in the 1960s, was elected to the Cape Elizabeth School Board. And that was at a time that the community was growing so rapidly they couldn't build classrooms fast enough. And it was a very challenging time. And he and other young leaders uh, were up to the task, built several additions to the elementary school, the middle school, got things underway to get the high school constructed. Uh, so, you know, really served it as an important time. In, in 1966, he was, he was elected to represent Cape Elizabeth in the Maine State House of Representatives. And you know what was interesting there, he was, he was a Republican, uh, very strong supporter of the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, which you know, as years go, one might not, one might be surprised by that. But uh, it is uh, there was a lot of discussion. One of his daughters mentioned that at his funeral service uh, last Friday. But he, he went on, and he was the Speaker of the Maine House of Representatives, and to my knowledge, was probably the only Speaker we ever had from the town of Cape Elizabeth. And, he then was succeeded by a gentleman named John Martin and by a number of other uh, Democrats. And I think it, it was until not until 2008 uh, that we had another Republican speaker with, when uh, Robert Nutting was elected. And it was when it was they had a nice ceremony, at least for Republicans, I suppose, uh, when uh, Mr. Nutting became the speaker. And it, one of the one of the aspects of that is they invited Dick Hughes to be there. And he was able to, to see, finally, someone from his party uh, go, go on to be speaker. He, he then ran for state senator from Cape Elizabeth uh, after serving five terms in the House. And for those of you that have been around a long time, he, he ran against a woman called Marietta Burroughs. And uh, when they announced the vote totals, I, I think uh, she won by two votes or something. And they had a recount, a uh, very contentious recount. And it ended up that Dick won the Senate race and uh, served, uh, served in the Senate uh, for, one, for one term. Uh, he then went on uh, to show his bipartisan nature. Uh, when Joe Brennan was governor, uh, there, was a, there was a vacancy on the uh, county, commission, county commissioners. And actually, Dick had worked with, uh, with Joe Brennan way, way back when they were, they were young attorneys together. And, and they worked together in the legislature uh, way back. And so he, he knew Dick's talents. He knew uh, how bipartisan he was and what a fair and decent person he was. And he was appointed a county commissioner. And you know, I don't know the exact number of years, but I think it was about 10 years that, uh, that Dick served as county commissioner. But it, uh, he has, uh, he had his wife, Betsy, that was a long time tennis coach uh, here for the girls uh, team in, in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, his, uh, his daughter, uh, one of the daughters, worked quite closely with, uh, she's an environmental manager at Eagle, Maine. Uh, there's another uh, son who lives in Cape Elizabeth, and then Carolyn Smith, another daughter, lives in Cape Elizabeth, uh, served on the Fulton's Advisory Committee, in, in addition to uh, you know, a couple of others that live outside of town. But just a, you know, a really nice family, and you know, to hear the different people who spoke on Friday at the memorial service, you know, I think they, they really captured Dick very well in his spirit of public service. And I think so much when we see division and uh, issues and people of different political parties who, who don't get along, it was, you know, it was nice to, to see different people of different parties uh, come together uh, you know, and hear the way they came together back in the, the 1970s and to hear people celebrate that as, as a noble thing and, 
and uh, uh, Dick Hughes was certainly the lead of that. He used to you know, come into the office a lot. And I'd always call him Mr. Speaker. And uh, you could see he had this twinkle in his eye. You know, no matter when you saw him, uh, he was just a, you know, a, a very dynamic individual uh, and someone, uh, you know, his family will miss him. I know his neighbors will miss him. And, uh, you know, he was just a, a wonderful leader for the state. So uh, he'll be missed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, <clears throat> next on the uh, agenda is review of the draft minutes of previ previous meetings for June 9, 2014. Is there a motion to approve the June 9, 2014 minutes? Council Wall? So moved. Is there a second? Council Ray? Any discussion, corrections? All those in favor? June 9th minutes are approved. June 16, 2014. Is there a motion to approve the June 16, 2014 minutes? Council Walsh? So moved. Is there a second? Council Ray? Any discussion, corrections? All those in favor? June 16 minutes are approved. Next on the ag agenda is a public hearing. <clears throat> We are holding a public hearing on the proposal to increase the number of seats permitted in a restaurant in a BA zone from 80 to 100 seats. So I'll open the public hearing and anyone who would like to speak may come up to the podium. You have a maximum of three minutes. Would anyone like to address the council? I will now close the public hearing. So we'll move on to item number 94, number of restaurant seats in a BA zone. The town council will review public hearing comments, there were none, and will consider amending the zoning ordinance. The proposal would increase the number of permitted seats from 80 to 100. Is there a motion to increase the number? Councilor Ray. The number of seats in the BA district restaurant from 80 to 100 as um, set by the ordinance committee and a vote from three to one to the town council. Is there a second? Councilor Walsh. And I, I, I meant to ask Councilor Ray to introduce the item. She, was chair she is chairman of the ordinance committee. Would you like to say, make any comments? I think it's pretty um, direct. Uh, we had a, a brief discussion about that, um, and um, it was understood that um, the request is, was from 80 to 100 seats. Um, there was a few comments, but not too many, and the ordinance committee voted three to zero to approve that and move it to the town council. Any other comments? Councilor Wall. Uh, just go to the process, if we approve this tonight, where does it go? Back to planning, or is it? Yeah. You know, this evening, it, it's merely, uh, if you approved it, it would become effective in 30 days. And if there was an establishment in the VA zone that wished to uh, take advantage of this, that currently is, is less than this number of seats, ought to be, it's what, what's allowed in there, uh, then uh, they would have the opportunity to apply that to the planning board for site planning. And, and then further on that, how long would that process take for a, an applicant? Is it three months? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Could, yeah. yeah. It, you know, it, it varies. Uh, it's, you know, the planning board, I think, you know, looking at the minutes and the discussion when they reviewed this, I would expect they would give a thorough review. Uh, uh, but, you know, it would, it would probably be a, a pre-application process. Uh, it would come up to, to the meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, they might want to do a site walk. They might want to mm -hmm. uh, to uh, you know, schedule a public hearing at a subsequent meeting. You know, these things generally take uh, four to five months. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. you, Councilor Jordan. I was just looking at the site plan requirements, and if you have an existing site plan and you're not changing anything. I don't see anywhere in the requirements that the number of seats in your restaurant is a requirement for the site plan. I was just curious as to why that would require a site plan amendment if you're not changing any parking or locations of buildings or anything like that. Whether the, once the ordinance is adopted, the interpretation 
of the ordinance uh, is the responsibility of the code enforcement officer. And, you know, it's really his judgment if it's a substantial change in use. Uh, and, you know, he, he reads the ordinance, see what it says. It's, it's my understanding that he has already opined that there are provisions in the ordinance which provide that site plan review would be required. Any other questions? Council Wagner? Yeah. I, I think having gone through the site plan review it probably has more to do with the parking issue. So it's probably you have to talk about the seats in order to prove that you have adequate parking for the seats. Um, anyway, the only question I had was about the effective date. Um, we've changed 80 to 100, but we haven't changed the effective date. Is that intentional? Yeah. Sure you yeah. The, the, the effective date is, is the date of the last change. If the ordinance is adopted, that would be revised to read uh, August 12, 2014. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay. Or 14, whatever the date is. 30 days from time. Anyone else? All those in favor? It's approved. Okay, next item is a public hearing. Rudy's Liquor uh, to, re to uh, uh, hear comments on the application of Rudy's Liquor License and Special Amusement Permit. I will now open public hearing. So any member of the public would like to address this issue? Seeing no one, I close the public hearing. Item number 95, Rudy's Liquor Licenses and Special Amusement Permit Application. The town council will, con uh, oh, we've had, <laughs> we're not going to consider public comments because there were none. Um, but anyway, they have uh, applied for the um, Malt, Spiritus, and Vinus License for, for Cape Elizabeth Hospitality Group, LLC, do, doing business as Rudy's of the Cape, located at 517 Ocean House Road. Is there a mm -hmm. motion to approve the applications? Councilor Sherman. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Council Walsh, any discussion? Council Wagner. Just a, a question whether or not the current um, applicant was the holder of the license previously. Uh, my recollection is there's some overlap when they purchased the property. Did, did he ever operate it under the license? If, if the town manager could. Yeah. Um, I am not sure of the exact legal entity. This this is actually the license is held by something other Cape Elizabeth Hospitality Group LLC. I'm not I'm I'm not sure if that was the LLC that held it, but it, but the the leadership of that LLC did run it for a while uh, as Rudy's when it closed. But if, whether or not it's the same legal entity, I don't know. Okay. Any other comments? All those in favor? It's approved. The next item is a public hearing on the general assistance appendices. Uh, I will ask the town manager to just introduce that item. Yes, every year um, the Main Municipal Association prepares some updates to the proposed general assistance appendices. Uh, there are three different appendices. One is an overall maximum per month on how much uh, a family, a person could be assisted with, with local welfare or general assistance. A second appendice is food maximums, and a third is housing. Uh, the MMA and the, the State Department of Human Services, whatever it's called now, uh, does provide that communities do not need to adopt all three, and specifically don't need to adopt a housing maximum. It's always been our tradition uh, that we adopt the, the overall maximum, and we adopt the food maximum, that, that, that because of the, the, the vagaries of housing costs and other things in Cape Elizabeth, and sometimes people find themselves temporarily uh, having a problem, though the housing costs are fairly high, uh, the, the town has never adopted an overall housing maximum. So I would recommend that you adopt the recommended overall maximums and the food maximum. Okay, thank you. We'll now open the public hearing. Does anyone in the audience wish to address the general app assistance appendices? Seeing no one, I will close public hearing. Item number 96, uh, <clears throat> is there a motion to accept the recommended appendices to the General Assistance Ordinance? Councilor Walsh? Yes, so moved. Is there a second? Councilor Sherman? Second. Is there any discussion? Any questions for the town manager? Councilor Wagner? Uh, Michael, sorry, I might not have 
been listening carefully enough, but the, the source of these appendices, where did you get them? Uh, it's partially the federal government, partially the U.S., the, the main department of human health services, services, whatever they call it, is it health and human services? Yeah. No. Health and human services, and then Maine Municipal Association is involved as well. Anyone else? All those in favor? It's approved. Item number 97, normal high water mark report from the ordinance committee. Um, initially, I'd like to ask the ordinance committee chairman to just say a few brief words about this item. Um, I know that uh, the town planner is in the audience, and you know, certainly counselors can call on her for questions as well, but if Councilor Ray would lead into this, please. Sure. Um, the Ordinance Committee met on June 27th to um, discuss the normal high water line zoning amendment. And um, we are recommending to the, uh, the Town Council the acceptance of the Planning Board recommendation of HAST plus three to the Town Council by a vote of three to zero. And I have to also um, thank the Town Council members who came to the presentation. Um, um, and that was very helpful, so people understood um, what was happening. And, and um, Peter, I'm sorry, Peter, oh gosh, I forgot his last name. Anyway, he um, made the presentation, and it was very helpful because he's very knowledgeable about that. But I did ask Maureen to come tonight to um, address any questions or maybe um, uh, because it, it's a complicated issue. Mm -hmm. And I think that we all are trying to work hard at understanding all the pieces. We've had a lot of public comment. So um, anyway, I would, that's about what I wanted to say. And I, it's in your packet, the proposal. Um, so I don't know if folks want to ask questions or want Maureen to address this or mm -hmm. whatever. Well, I'd like to just give, just for council's benefit and people in the audience and at home, just a brief timeline. Maureen O'Meara may have been planning to do this, just to see where this has come. Initially, this was uh, referred by the council to the planning board in March of 2013 at the request of our code enforcement officer due to the difficulties and inconsistencies of interpreting the normal high water line for coastal waters. So we referred it to the planning board. Uh, we received it back from them on April 14th of this year. Then we referred it to ordinance. And so the ordinance committee is now sending it back to us for review. So it, and it was very, uh, very good, I think, that we had full council attendance at that. It was May 29, I believe, I think so. yep. ordinance committee meeting of this year to hear Peter Slavinsky, who is the main geological uh, from the Maine Geological Survey, who really gave us a very, it was fascinating actually, presentation on sea level rise, which is, which I think was critical to uh, this whole process and understanding everything. So with the council's permission, I think it, this would be a good time to ask Maureen O'Meara to present us some of the mapping that, we've, that we saw. Yes. Okay. Good evening. <laughs> And if someone wants to turn on that back row, off that back row lights, it might be a little easier to see. But um, most of you have seen this before, and my plan was to talk for just a few minutes and then um, to really let you ask me, because this can go on for quite some time. But what I have in front of you is uh, an aerial photo of Cape Elizabeth, and overlaid onto that is the highest astronomical tide and then the highest astronomical tide which we refer to as HAST plus one foot plus two foot and plus three feet and I, I do apologize this doesn't look any better but what I'd like you to see is right here you can see this kind of orangey area and then right in here you can see some orange right here that's Alewife Brook and up here is Pond Cove I don't know why that's doing that so do this. There we go. What I'd like to do is just kind of zoom in to, to the Spurwink Marsh area and give you a little better sense of what we've got going on here. And 
Come on. We're actually linking to a computer upstairs, so it's a little cranky. <laughs> Apparently very cranky. Okay. Okay, this is as good as it's gonna get. So this very pale color and is, is the highest astronomical tide. And then you can see how it starts to change into a little slightly darker color. In here, that's plus one. That orangey color is plus two. And the very deepest colors are plus three. And those are all feet, plus one foot? Plus two foot, plus three foot. That's right. So the question was, if the town decides to go with hast, as opposed to what you have right now, and then you decide to add one, two, or three feet, what are the impacts? And when you first look at this, it looks like the impacts are pretty significant. But one of the things you need to remember is that the town of Cape Elizabeth has its own local wetland regulations. Those are in place right now. The town has uh, had those in place since May of 1990. And they impose a tremendous amount of protection on local, on local wetlands that you will not find protected as stringently anywhere else in the state of Maine. So uh, what we can do is add those land use regulations and all of this light green you see here are places that are already regulated by the town's wetland regulations but there's more because in these uh, darker wetland areas uh, not only are do we not allow anything to happen in the wetland but we also impose 250 foot buffer so when i add the 250 foot buffer Okay, the question you have to ask yourself now is, what are you looking at? Are, the, for example, this heavy green air line right here, are there any orange areas upland of this green line? And as you can see, there aren't any. Um, up in here, this, this orange area is already in uh, an RP1 wetland buffer. So there's, there's really no place here where the HAST plus three is adding any regulation to an area that isn't already protected. So I'm going to stop for a minute. Does that make sense to everyone? Mm -hmm. OK. Um, I can zoom. There are, there are four major areas where you're going to see some impact. Uh, at Pond Cove, at Alewife Brook, and a little bit at Crescent Beach. I can zoom into each one of those areas and take a look at that again. Is that something you would like to see? Wood, yeah. Wood? OK. Um, general you. consensus that that would be a good thing to do. OK. So let's. So we're going to go here to Pond Cove. And this is when I have to remind you, I'm going to turn off the hast for a minute. And there. So what you have right here is a Shore Road. This is the Atlantic Ocean. And I think pretty much all of you can see this big pond here that most of you can see when you drive down Shore Road. And then there's another pond deeper down over here. Well, this is an example of where our Shoreland, our town map, which is right behind me, uh, has a note on it that says that the zoning map suggests the location of resource protection boundary lines, but the actual boundary of a resource protection boundary line has to be field verified. What we do is we have a definition in the ordinance. It says if you're an RP1 wetland, you have to have very poorly drained soils, you have to have obligate wetland vegetation, and we have to have that mapped. And if we go out and map it, and this line right here um, doesn't map what we find in the field, this line moves to where the field physical, those physical characteristics actually, actually exist. So in this area, I can turn on the town's wetland mapping and it'll show this wetland right here, but it will not show this wetland right here. Nevertheless, when people in this neighborhood have come in for permits, they've had to identify what kind of wetland this is and we know that this has an RP1 wetland characteristic. So this is regulated as an RP1 wetland. It's just not showing up on our maps. So again, I will turn on the hast layers and you can see that right along the coast you've got that very pale hast and then there's a little bit like say right here of that medium color and then here are your very dark oranges so this is where the hast plus three would come in 
and at first blush it looks that, like a HAST plus three regulation would impose regulation that doesn't already exist in this area. But if we turn on our wetland zones, we find that we've got a whole bunch of RP1 right here, and we do have RP1 here. It's just not showing up on our map, but it does have the characteristics. And then if we add the 250 foot buffer, and there's the buffer, you can see that this entire area is already getting picked up under our existing regulations. And this area would also, that, that buffer would actually continue to here, and it would continue down to here. So here we have another example of where the HAST really isn't having um, that much of an added impact. It's really already building on what you have. Um, unless there are questions, I'll go to Alewife Brook. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, please. And again, you can see kind of that ribbon of orange. And this is another area where you can see the hast, and then the one, the two, the three, and then obviously the three is really reaching inland, and it's reaching in here. This area actually has a culvert that connects from the Atlantic Ocean and put, goes into this area. And I don't know if you can see it or not, but um, if you look at the vegetation right here, you can see it's that really gray kind of wetland vegetation that, and then the same thing is happening right here. It's the same very wet wetland vegetation. So I turn on the Hass layers and then I turn on your wetland mapping and the wetland mapping is just this green blob that covers all of this. This wetland is not getting picked up by our current wetland mapping, but it would qualify under our wetland definition. And then we have our RP2, which is right here. And as you can see at this point, there's pretty much no inland orange hast that isn't going to get picked up as an RP zone and already regulated. So those are the, the three areas I was going to zoom in on. I can also, if you want, look at Shore Acres because it's been a discussion. And yes, I'm seeing, a, I'm seeing interest in that. So let's do that. Okay, so what's interesting about this is you can see how the rocks are really white up here and then you start to see staining down below and uh, the code officer has given me permission to make a few comments on his behalf, but this is what he's typically using is the staining on the rocks and the vegetation to establish the normal high water line under our current definition. And his concern is that that really relies on an individual making their own best judgment, and that he would prefer that we had a definition that was scientifically based, that could be consistently applied, that predictably most people that would go out there would agree that's the place where it is. And the definition we have right now, he is having issues with. So with HAST, what happens is, you can see again, HAST is this very pale color, and then right here, you've got HAS plus one, HAS plus two, HAS plus three. It really lines up almost on top of each other because this is a very rocky coastline. It's got very vertical tendencies, and HAS is going to land almost exactly one, two, and three in the same place. Uh, the other thing, if I show you the RP, the RP zones have almost no impact here because there's no wetlands here. But what might be interesting to look at, and I know this has been the discussion by members of the public, is where the shoreland zoning line that we have right now sits. So this line right here is if you take the shoreland zoning line that's on this map, um, this is where it, it shows the normal high water line to be. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is that this line has never been used as the basis for permit. 
Uh, we've looked at the records. The code officers spent a lot of time looking at the records. What code officers in the past, in the present, are doing are using what we call the visual inspection method. They're going out there, they're looking for staining of the rocks, they're looking for vegetation. So this line is not very accurate. It's never been, uh, pretends to be accurate. It was drawn in the 1990s by a professional cartographer on a paper map. And then when the town went to this computerized mapping system, we took that data and we digitized it. And then we, we lay it over things like aerial photos and base parcel maps and road center lines. But it's, it's not really accurate just because you can zoom into it. Uh, I can probably show you another example of um, how accurate that line is if we go in this area. And I'll turn off the Hass layers. And what we find is that this line is in the water on this part of town. It's way, way below where the staining of the rocks would be. And some places, if you follow it around the coastline, it's, it's sitting in the water. And just like this line would not be used to measure the normal high water line setback for this part of town, this line isn't being used in the Shore Acres area or, or any other part of town. Um, there is a documentation that the state puts out EP information sheet, and even this information sheet says it recognizes that towns have limited resources and that their mapping is going to be somewhat constrained. And they talk about identifying these lines based on the visual inspection method and the elevation method. And the visual inspection method is what we're using right now. And the proposal is really to go to the elevation method, where you set a line that any surveyor could go out there. And if you took two or three surveyors out there, they'd probably all agree that's in the same spot. So it's very predictable. It's very consistent. Um, that's all I had for a presentation, but I'm certainly willing to handle anything else you have for questions. Um, any questions for Maureen at this time? We can always ask her to so, um, Jordan. Um, the Hass plus three, similar to our wetland zone, and we then have a buffer. Is there a buffer, or is the Hass plus three the line? No, no. The Hass plus three is just the line, and, and this definition would be used for applying shoreland zoning. So anywhere where you have shoreland zoning, you, you would measure your normal high water line using this definition. And you would measure 250 feet inland. And in that 250 feet, your activities are regulated. Um, the first 75 feet your, is your setback. But you can do, if you're already within 75 feet, there are, you would be non-conforming and there are things you're still allowed to do. If you're beyond 75 feet, you are a lot more flexible, but anything within that 250 feet would be regulated. Council Walsh? Uh, Maureen, what yep. other towns have adopted this? Uh, there are not, this, nor, this definition, mm -hmm. we'd have to step back. All, our, the current definition that we're using Nobody has it. Most towns are using the highest annual tide definition that is part of the mandated state um, shoreland zoning. The uh, Maine Geological Survey has recommended to the DEP that they move from the highest annual tide standard to the highest astronomical tide. And there is high expectation that the state will be doing that at some point. So we are actually targeting ourselves to move to a standard that is what the state's looking at. The plus one, two, or three would really put Cape Elizabeth in the lead in terms of environmental protection. There are a few towns just south of Cape Elizabeth that aren't, um, they aren't fortunate enough to have the rocky coastline that Cape Elizabeth has. They are much lower to sea level, and they have done some things like add extra feet um, to their floodplain requirements. So Cape Elizabeth would definitely be in the lead if you went with a hast plus one, two, or three feet. Thank you. Council Wagner. So the, the two big issues that jump out at me are, one, we, we've heard uh, Deb Murphy speak before about the 
the difference between what, at least in her opinion, is the, the existing boundary, um, and I think it's based on what the zoning map is, and what our proposed HAST plus three would be. And at least, if I understand Ms. Mrs. Murphy correctly, it would be that the proposed change would make it less restrictive on development on that shoreland zone, at least in the, sh the part of shore acres that she's talking about. Um, and I, is that consonant with your understanding? That's my understanding of her position, yes. Right. And so what's your take on that? Do you, do you disagree with her opinion on that? And yes, and, and I, I have to tell you that um, it's not my take, it's the code enforcement officer's take. Right. I don't have authority to interpret the ordinance, and he does. And the answer is that he is not, and not in one instance, is he taking this shoreland zoning line and zooming into this map and using it to measure setbacks of 75 feet. Not in one instance has he done that. We have not found one instance where any permit has ever used this data in that manner. What is happening is people are going out to the site and they're looking at the physical characteristics. They're looking at staining on the rocks, they're looking at the presence of vegetation, and they're establishing this is the normal high water line for this property. And the challenge for the code officer has been, and, and it's, it's littered throughout the town's records, is that there has been a lack of consistency in how that's been applied. In the Mac case, it was applied at a much higher level on one side of a peninsula because they were trying to get to that effect of the tides. And how do you document the spray of the water during a storm event? Sometimes it's easy, sometimes not so much. Um, we have examples of the code enforcement officer uh, using the highest annual tide. That's been the most commonest one. Even, even though we say top of the bank in our definition, almost, almost all of our permits have been issued based on highest annual tide. We actually, the code officer found an example where it was, it was, it, the permit was issued based on mean high tide, which is even below highest annual tide. Um, and we have a case, um, the Armstrong case in the 2000s, where the permit was issued based on the highest astronomical tide. So the, the challenge is that our ordinance and the courts have recognized that the definition means different things. And it's whatever the code officer says it means. Councilor Wright? I just wanted to add a piece. Um, when the ordinance committee was talking about this and my two um, fellow ordinance, um, Jim and Jamie can maybe uh, discuss this, but um, we talked about uh, a preparation of a communication plan where the public notices would be mailed to property owners in impacted shoreland, shoreland zoning areas and also a presentation of the town council meeting showing how the proposed changes relate to existing town regulations. So we were very, uh, we tried to be very sensitive to the fact that if this actually impacts anybody, we want to make sure that we're clear about who that impacts, make sure that we're communicating with those folks and so forth. So um, we were very clear about that. Um, and we talked about that in, in being a fairly um, big process. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if Jim or Jamie want to want, want, you know, add to that. but. Um, we were trying to be very sensitive to the fact that if it impacts anybody versus what we currently have. I mean, our, our intent was to try to be consistent and not have things that are sort of all over the place, but be consistent going forward. But if it's really impacting somebody, we want to make sure that we're, we're clear who it's impacting and what that impact is, so. Okay. Councilor Jordan, did you want to? Um, tonight we're just looking to set this for a public hearing. So my only comment or question is, um, the notice going out to those being impacted, are we going to make sure that we get those notices out for the public hearing so they have a chance to come and voice their opinion? Yeah. That, was, that was our intent. That was our intent. We wanted to be upfront about it so people knew. We've already had a discussion of that and we'll be sending far more extensive notices than the, the legal requirement would be. Uh, we're sending it to everyone in the shoreland zone in neighborhoods that are impacted by the shoreland zone, for example, in the Lawson Road neighborhood, it, it would seem as though we needed to send it to a few, but we're sending it to the whole neighborhood. Uh, it'd also be advertised in the newspaper twice. Uh, so we're really going to try to get the word out about this. Councilor Sherman? I have the same question. So. 
that's it. Okay. Do you need a motion? Yes, is there a motion? Do you want to? Um, oh, excuse me, Council Walsh. Does uh, any member of the public wish to comment on this item? You will have three minutes maximum. Well, just we just have a requirement that if anyone wants to do audio visual, it's in the council rules. Oh. They need to get it to us by noon mm -hmm. or more. The council can waive any requirement, but we specifically put that requirement in so that we had a public record of whatever was presented. And uh, wow, I've been to several meetings, and that's never been mentioned. So of the town council. Yep. Well, or, yeah. or, or, uh, <laughs> and I plugged in before, but that's okay. Um, anyway, it's, it's, uh, we have a three minute limit. Is the council interested in allowing Mrs. Murphy to set up her computer? And, mm -hmm. and in addition to the three minutes of speaking, or shall we include that? Councilor Sherman? We're going to have a public hearing, so I, I would certainly hope that you could make that presentation at our next meeting. So I'd be inclined to just allow the regular three minutes. Okay, I feel that's that fine. About it, but we have a pretty full agenda tonight as well. Yes. Um, just a comment on a few things that Maureen had mentioned. Um, the rocky shore of Cape Elizabeth is not under resource protection. So when you look at those four areas that are really critical and that actually were identified to the town by the Casco Bay Estuaries Project, those have resource protection, so they have additional protection. So it, any change seems to not make much of a difference because, but it doesn't some, but overall not much because there are other overlying protections. But on the rocky ledges, that isn't true. The other comment that was made about what Ben is or is not doing or the prior code enforcement officer is doing legally, the code enforcement officer and is trained by the state planning office and it's covered in our ordinance in 19.2.5, I believe. The first place you go is the zoning map. So I had sent an email to all of you. I hope you get a chance to see it. Um, and what I was going to show tonight was what Maureen was showing at Surfside Avenue, where there, the zoning boundary off of the lot off of Surfside, which the dumpy zone, it goes between their pool and the corner of the lot boundary. And when you take the data set that Judy Colby George provided, when Maureen mentioned it was drawn by hand and then painstakingly digitized so that it could be used digitally to create maps like this, two-dimensional maps, and now overlaid on Google Earth satellite maps. That line, both on this two-dimensional map, if you overlay this and you look at this line where the district boundary is, and you look at it where it is on the digital map overlaid on a satellite picture, it's in the same place. The data is very accurate. It represents only two layers, which are the lot boundaries and the shoreland zone. It's very, very accurate. So on the rocky ledges, um, I don't feel that because we're trying to do something with sea level rise in the resource protected areas, which seem to be not all that effective because of all of the protections, that now the rocky ledges should be um, affected and allowed to become less restrictive in the shoreland zone. And there's language in the ordinance and in the state guidelines um, that state that if, if a shoreland zone boundary on the official map is, is at or close to a land boundary, a property boundary, or the center line of the road, there it shall be. So we've shown you, and we can sh we've, we've tried so hard to work at this with everybody, but it's been very difficult to show the difference between our shoreland zone and what's being proposed. And this is the first time in this entire process since 2013 that we've ever, ever seen that boundary. And that's really a shame. And also, I'd like to know how that boundary came up because it looks like it was drawn. Um, so, thank you, Mrs. Yeah. Murphy. Yes. Just if, if I might, I did, did want to read the section from the council rules so that, you know, just to remind everyone, uh, and if anyone wants to in the future, it's Article 2, Section 8, Electronic Presentations. Any person desiring to include as part of the presentation any material that requires projection should provide the presentation to the town clerk by noon of 
the date of any meeting so that the presentation may be preloaded and ready to project. A copy of the presentation will also be maintained as public record. I just, in case, you know, in the future, uh, anyone wishes to do that, I, I just wanted to make sure everyone understood the provision. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Hi, my name is Maynard Murphy. I live at 24 Pilot Point Road. I believe the amendments to the normal high water line and shoreland overlay district are not necessary and even damaging to our environment. Uh, to date, as of when I wrote this, I had not seen the town provide a true comparison of the current shoreland zone to what the shoreland zone would look like as a result of the proposed changes to the normal high water line. We have uh, been to several meetings on this issue and urged and asked for this comparison. And as Mrs. Murphy said, this is the first time we've seen it. You can look at what the new uh, shoreland zone boundaries would be on a map all you want, but without comparing what we currently have to the official map in the ordinance, uh, you can never see the real impact of the shoreland zone. In some cases, properties not currently in the shoreland zone will be added by the proposed change, but in most cases, properties will be removed or at least partially removed from the shoreland zone. Those property owners affected by the former will not be happy with you, and the property owners affected by the latter will find that they can now build structures and establish lawns closer to the ocean, thereby increasing stormwater runoff. And when will we decide that we have polluted the waters enough with poisonous and toxic chemicals and pesticides? Does it make sense that we pollute the very waters that we also harvest food from? No, but do we want to add to that problem? At this specific point in our history at time, in time, with ocean acidification, sea level rise, CO2 increasing, does it make sense that the town would be would like to be less restrictive with shoreland zoning, thereby becoming more polluting to the ocean. I submit to you that with the proposed change, all of this will happen. Many more properties will be removed from the official shoreland zone than will be added. More polluted runoff will go into the ocean, and more and more people will continue to eat Casco Bay lobster and other seafood that consumes these pollutants and pesticides. Sea level will continue to rise. Ocean acidification will continue. So as a concerned citizen of this town, I strongly urge you to become more educated on the issue and insist on seeing the true comparison of our current shoreland zone to the proposed shoreland zone. Please do not allow the proposed change of our ordinance. I believe they are unnecessary and detrimental, detrimental to our shoreland and ocean environments. Do you want to move from what Peter Slavinsky said was uh, do you want to go to what Peter Slavinsky stated was a gold standard from our current platinum standard? Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to this item number? I'm Sheila Mayberry, 30 Trundy Road. I just wanted to make a few comments, but uh, really, they reflect what has been previously said, and I sent an email to you earlier. Uh, based on tonight's presentation with respect to the mapping, I urge you to, to take this to a workshop first and really look at what the impact will be. Tonight is the first night you have seen some critical information with respect to where the current boundary line is. Uh, and even at that, it was pretty murky. I've seen excellent mapping from Google Earth that overlays uh, uh, the boundary map with what the official map is that we have. And it's, it's much more striking than what we saw tonight with the blue line. Um, and even with the blue line, you saw that uh, there in the, in the Shore Acres neighborhood, and I think there's one other um, area, Rocky Ledge area, where uh, there will be a negative impact because of uh, uh, the impact of the proposed amendment. Um, so um, <clears throat> I really urge you to take this 
at least to one workshop and really study this and maybe get some better mapping than you had seen tonight because it's out there. It's for you to really study and, and look at this. Um, and I had made some other comments about the requirement to use the official map that uh, uh, is stated in the ordinance as well as, as in the DEP guidelines, Chapter 1000, Section 9, uh, and how important the map is as the first place to go. Uh, and even the DEP cited uh, the uh, law court's uh, urgence that it is the first place to go uh, when looking at the boundary lines, not field determination of where those boundary lines are. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address the council on this issue? My name is Richard Bryant, and I live at 55 Sperling here in Cape. Um, I apologize for arriving a little late, and I didn't get to see the presentation made by the uh, planning director. But I do want to support the position I saw noticed in Ms. Mayberry's letter, <coughs> excuse me, which is that I think the council needs to take a very good look at the mapping uh, between what exists on our current zoning map and what's proposed in the ordinance. Um, and I, again, have not seen what the planning director presented, but I have seen uh, independently, privately uh, uh, created maps, which were very detailed and showed some pretty striking differences between the existing zoning and the proposed zoning, at least with respect to rocky shore areas, um, which is where I have my major focus. So again, I would urge you to um, listen to what Ms. Mayberry had said in her letter, and I do I uh, urge you as well to get some clean uh, mapping so you can really compare what you're doing, and especially in those rocky ledge areas along the shore, because I think we're stepping backwards rather than stepping forward, and I think that's a bad idea. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? We will close the public comment session. And I, I think we didn't quite get our motion because I think I interrupted Council Walsh so we could have a public comment. So maybe Council Ray. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, Peter Slavinsky, I remembered his last name, thing, and Maureen O'Meara, town planner, for helping us with uh, this complicated issue. And I would like to move that the town council set a public hearing on the proposal for Monday, August 11th, 2014, at 7 p.m. at the town, Cape Lucia Town Hall. Is there a second? Second. Yeah. Any other discussion? Oh, Councilor Wagner? Uh, I'm inclined to, I mean, personally, I, I see some merit to Sheila Mayberry's request for workshop on this. I, I, I really appreciated and I think I understood uh, Mr. Slavinsky's presentation. I think it was very helpful. But what, what I see remaining is two essential questions, which is one, would, at least in some areas of town, would there be an environmental uh, kind of step back in the rules, would it provide less environmental protection, which is the argument put forward by uh, the residents uh, that spoke today. And then the other question is, um, will there be citizens that, whose property is negatively impacted, for, you know, versus the separate question, just normal environmental degradation versus will someone's half of their property no longer be buildable, that sort of question. So. I mean, what I encourage the public to do is, you know, whatever side you fall on, like, hey, watch out for my property because I think they're going to impact me. Make sure that we know your comments, and then the people who are, have the environmental concerns, <laughs> the people that have the environmental concerns who've spoken today, and if there's other people that have environmental, environmental concerns, to contact us, because those are the kind of two big issues. And I mean, I'm, I want to be sensitive to both of them. Um, maybe we can do that with the public public hearing and then all the impact because I know we want to reduce the amount of time we spend on these things too but um. well what what I would recommend at this moment is that we move on the issue of public hearing and then maybe discuss the workshop as a separate item what, what is the rest of the council uh, I don't disagree with you but I'm just wondering with the notice that we're going to mail to everyone is there the opportunity to to cover the two extremes that Jamie 
the scribes, so that when we get feedback, however we get it, whether we get an email or whether we get it in public at the hearing, people have looked at the two, two questions. And I just wonder if there's a way to, to shape that notice so that it actually gets to those questions. Yeah. I, I, just a thought, that's all. Well, uh, Councilor Sherman. I, mean, I, I would like us to move forward to a public hearing in August, and like we do at every public hearing, we can decide if, if there's still some uncertainty among the members of the council that we might then go to a workshop to try to deal with that. Um, at that I, time. I think that makes sense. I'm not firmly of that view. If, if there wasn't enough people on the council who wanted to do a workshop first, I wouldn't have a huge issue, but I feel like the issue has been teed up and we ought to move it forward. Anyone else? Uh, I'll weigh in. I tend to agree with actually what Councilor Sherman is saying. I mean, we, we had full council participation at the Ordinance Committee meeting. The Planning Board has spent a year on this, had six workshops, eight regular meetings, and three public hearings. So they've, they've looked at this very thoroughly. And I think we've certainly had a very good and thorough uh, review of this. So I'm personally in favor of setting a public hearing and then perhaps determining at that date whether we should move forward with the workshop. I'm okay with that. Okay, so we had, uh, did we have, did we have that motion? I you made the motion. Yes, you did. Seconded. Yeah, okay. It was a second. Any more discussion? No? All those in favor? Okay, it's approved. It's okay, next item, item number 98, naming recognition with, within and on the grounds of the Thomas Memorial Library. The Library Building Committee has recommended opportunities for naming recognitions on the library grounds and within the library. Uh, Frank Arnelli is here. He has very graciously accepted the role of presenting this in the absence of Councillor McCausland. And uh, so welcome, Frank. Thank you. <laughs> it's Thank fun you. to see you <laughs> here at the podium and not it's sitting very comfortable us. on this side. Empty seat up here. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> So um, back in November, when the town council approved, or accepted rather, the uh, library, library Planning Committee's recommendation on the um, renovation of the Thomas Memorial Library, a key part of the recommendation was that for furniture, fixtures, and equipment, there would be a public, a private rather, fundraising effort uh, equal to um, $500,000. The uh, key part of undertaking this effort was to identify uh, methods by which we could motivate and uh, support that kind of fundraising. And it was recommended at that point that we would uh, allow for naming opportunities for recognition for donors uh, in, the li in and around the library. Uh, since then, the Library Building Committee has worked with uh, members of the foundation, trustees, capital campaign committee, um, architects, uh, designers, and uh, various members of the community who have experience in fundraising come up with a proposal uh, to identify locations within the library and around the library that are suitable for um, naming recognition to put plaques up that would uh, uh, represent or recognize donations they've made in support of the um, furniture, fixture, and equipment for the library. Um, so what I've what we've prepared, what the committee has prepared, is uh, a listing of all those locations uh, in and around the library with dollar amounts um, tied to them, which would be the minimum amount required in order to um, minimum amount required for donations in order to have uh, names associated with these locations. I think uh, right from the start, it's really important to comment on the fact that. The, the residents of Cape Elizabeth are paying for the construction of this library, and the great recognition and, I mean, gratitude needs to be extended to the residents of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, the money that will be, uh, if they approve the referendum that we use to build the library, will be assisted and supported by private donations for furniture, uh, fixtures, and equipment. So, uh, first off, I want to note, mention that uh, the proposal currently is that at the entry of the library there will be a, uh, a plaque which represents uh, donate donors, uh, but pr primary amongst those donors are really the taxpayers of Cape Elizabeth who will be paying, paying for the construction of the library if they approve the referendum. Um, within the library, we've identified a number of locations that will, taken together, uh, create the opportunity for raising the $500,000. 
And I just wanted to highlight some key points in terms of how we approach this, uh, this effort. First of all, as I already mentioned, we uh, reached out to a lot of people in the community and come up, come up with some good recommendations and insights that would help the effort. Um, secondly, we um, determined that in order to uh, attract uh, gifts of a certain size, that the minimum gift would be $1,000, uh, which would enable folks to have their name on the, uh, the overall plaque. The minimum gift for specific locations in and around the library would be $5,000. And uh, we've identified uh, 23 locations in the library that could be suitable for plaques. And we've identified a uh, staircase as places w which would that could be suitable for engraving. The logic we use in terms of coming up with this effort, uh, first of all, started off with us visiting many libraries and seeing what other institutions uh, did to, to uh, achieve the same kind of outcome. And the framework we thought about was that the, the uh, location would, and the dollar amount associated with that location would be related to uh, things like visibility and prominence of that location, uh, the size of the uh, location, a large room or small space, the specialness of the location. Some folks have an have a, uh, appreciation for one part of the library versus another, children's area or adult area, for example. And, and finally, the expense associated with outfitting that particular location, um, for example, technical equipment that might be required in a small room. The, um, the um, a key part, finally, the key part of this overall recommendation is that this is not only a private fundraising with a handful of folks, but rather we're hoping and then encouraging it to be supported by a broad uh, proportion of, of the uh, residents in Cape Elizabeth. And therefore, um, uh, we're, uh, the proposal includes the expectation and hope that uh, we could raise $50,000 in smaller gifts below the naming area, which not only are important in terms of supporting this effort, but I think are important in terms of representing sort of a vote of confidence, uh, not only in the, re the uh, renovation, but in support of the long-term future for the Thomas Memorial Library. So that's sort of the overview. Uh, the list that, is, that Mike put up is presented on the, on the wall there. Uh, includes all of the locations, the dollar amounts associated with them. They're on the document that uh, was submitted and it's on the website. I could go through them individually or uh, probably better off if uh, folks ask questions if they have any. Does anyone have any questions for Frank? Council Mayor? So, Frank, on the, um, the actual names that people could choose, is that kind of just sky's the limit? No, we'll, um, we have to be very prescribed in that respect. Uh, each location, well, aside from the stairs, which will just be the names, each location will be identified, for example, the children's reading area or the outdoor garden, things like that. So that will be determined in advance and donors will know what the name will be. And then the donors will have the choice of whether or not they want to name it the Jamie Wagner room or the Wagner family room or, you know, the the, the name of the family they'll be involved. So would, would it be required to be the family name, or what if they want to just name it after their great-grandmother or something like That's that? That's possible as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Anything else? All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. This is uh, very exciting, and the Capital Campaign Committee has clearly been, and we know, has been very hard at work. So is there a motion to approve the naming recognitions uh, on the library grounds and within the library as proposed by the Library Building Committee. So moved. Councilor Ray. Is there a second? Second. Council Wagner, any more discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Madam <coughs> Chair. I'm sorry, guys. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Chairman. So, first, thanks, Frank. Good to see you. Uh, thanks, Martha. Uh, Bob. I also did want to mention tomorrow night the planning board will be having a public hearing and a review of the site plan for the Tarsborough Library, if anyone is interested in that. It's in uh, this room at uh, 7 o'clock tomorrow night. And at the August town council meeting, the library building committee will be presenting for council approval the final plan for the library. Uh, we'll be asked to set a vote for November uh, on uh, a potential $4 million in public spending for the library. Uh, and we'll, we'll also be asked to approve a bond resolution uh, authorizing the borrowing of that money subject to a citizen approval uh, in November. Thank you. Next item, item number 99, review of process for Greenbelt plan update. 
completed in January 2014. Um, these, this was the report submitted by Councilors Wagner and Jordan. So, which of you would like to present this item? James, welcome. <laughs> it looks like Council Wagner. Uh, thank you, Caitlin. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, speak first. Uh, we um, met with Mike McGovern regarding this uh, this task, and we, we kind of brainstormed about the the issues that we heard that came from the public on, after the uh, the Greenbelt plan. Um, many many um, meetings that they had uh, the Conservation Commission, and we just tried to draw some lessons, you know, learn some lessons from that process and come up with some recommendations to the council which are conveyed in this two-page memo that uh, Michael and Caitlin and I worked on collaboratively. Um, so one of the things, uh, maybe what I'll do is just try to encapsulate the, the recommendations um, without going back through the complaints. Um, so when the town is taking on major studies and reviews, um, that we can anticipate they'll be somewhat controversial. We uh, think that it's important for uh, a timeline be established so that we, these don't get drawn out um, uh, too extensively because I think one of the lessons we've learned is that possibly with the Greenbelt plan, we, we might have overdone it on the amount of um, public input because a lot of it was repetitive public input. And we thought that we want to encourage more uh, written communications and maybe less uh, oral communications. Not not that people aren't welcome to come and speak, but that um, maybe less opportunity for the oral versus the written because now we have such a, a wonderful ability to receive written communications through email or um, and we've talked about some other potential ways to receive this feedback. We've, uh, we're suggesting maybe doing a, a Facebook pilot where we could have comments on, on a topic on the uh, uh, town Facebook page, uh, which I think is a good idea. It'll be via test. Maybe it won't work that well, maybe it will. But Facebook has become such a, a hub for uh, interacting and sharing ideas that uh, I think it's worth a try. Um, the, um, one of the, the big things that we drew specifically from the Green Belt plan committee uh, was that we want to avoid putting people's uh, properties uh, on town websites until we're further on in the process. That we thought that there was a, a, some legitimacy to the complaints that people felt that maybe the town was giving this feeling to other members of the community that, look, here's some access points when really they were just concepts. and. and specifically when certain people had made very clear that there was no way that they were going to grant access to their property that maybe we should have uh, held off until later. And that's not to say that the individual committee shouldn't have the ability to use visual aids and maps, but on the official town websites that we had wait till further on in the process to do that. So I think, Caitlin, do you have anything to add? No, that pretty much sums it up. And there's a two-page memo for you to read if you have any questions or if, if you've read it, if you have any questions now. Um, uh, well, I think what I should do is ask, well, are there any comments in the last for motion to receive? Did you also write? you want to make it? Let's make a motion. motion. Is there a motion to receive the report, <laughs> the review of the process for the Greenbelt plan update completed in January 2014? Council Ray, is there a motion? No, I'm not going to make the motion. <laughs> I have questions. Well, I, what I was going to do was... Make the motion, I, do I was going to allow him to speak, but I already had the motion on the table. We can, I will allow Mr. Steer to speak. Let's just go ahead. I'll, I'll move that we receive the report uh, regarding the process around the Greenbelt Trail system. All right. We'll second it. Is there a second? Okay. Um, discussion. 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 Thank you. Um, <laughs> and then I will allow public comment. Thank you for doing this work. Um, I have two things. Um, first of all, um, you offer the following suggestions to enhance public knowledge of town proposals on municipal studies and to be respectful of private property. 
and it indicates no private property should be shown on the town's website as the focal area of a town proposal without advanced knowledge to the property owner of the upcoming proposal. I would be more comfortable if the knowledge to was changed to permission from. Um, I am not comfortable that there is something put out there without permission from the property owner, the current property owner, and I understand that that could change over time. Um, but I don't think there should be anything out there with potential paths and so forth without um, the permission from the property owner. And my other um, comment is um, another following suggestion, talking about Facebook. Um, how do I say this? I don't think that the town should be involved in having to um, put out Facebook and respond and so forth. I remember there was a time back a few years ago where the, time, uh, the town had um, uh, the ability to make comments um, on the website, and um, I think it was a waste of time. I think it was a waste of comments. I mean, people can make comments anyway. They can send comments to the town manager. They can send comments to the town councilors. But as far as spending t taxpayer dollars to set up a Facebook account where people can say whatever they want to say, and for those of us who see Facebook and they see all the things that are there, um, I think that's a waste of the town's time. I think it's a waste of the town. The taxpayers' dollars, I don't think town employees should be doing that. Um, so, um, those are my comments. Okay. And, um, else? Yeah. I was just gonna respond. Um, I would totally agree with the first one about getting the permission. I have no problem with that. Um, and a lot of discussion actually occurred about the Facebook issue because one of my concerns was if we do create a Facebook page, what is the responsibility of the councillors and the committee members to follow the Facebook page? Um, and that's when we decided to try maybe a literally a pilot, just do it once and see what happens. Um, because I had the same sentiment about, you know, we get emails and we get plenty of emails and it takes us enough time to read them. So I had similar issues about the comments that you might find on the Facebook page that you would miss because somebody wouldn't feel comfortable sending an email. But then are we and other committee members responsible for reading every comment? So that's definitely something I think to be considered. Okay, Councilor Sharon. Yeah, I, I have similar reservations on the social media suggestion, but I think it might be worth a, 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 an attempt on a particular issue to see how that might work. Uh, I know the blog we had in the municipal, municipal budget four or five years ago turned into a bit of a nuisance and we had about three residents who seemed to be serial uh, commentators uh, and you know you can be clever and adopt different names and aliases uh, Facebook you typically when you comment your picture goes on and you're there for everyone to see and there could be some advantage to that because a citizen sends us an email well only we get it and the citizen sees it not everybody else so there could be some benefit it, it might be worth just a try um, in terms of getting permission uh, I don't know at what point, because conceptually sometimes it would be helpful for a committee to talk about a proposed trail in a very preliminary stage, uh, and I certainly understand that you wouldn't want that showing up on the website, uh, but I'd hate for a committee to be handcuffed, and I, I should reread this memo. Yeah, it's um, just to go on the website. Okay. It's so not to restrict, restrict the committee. Okay. It's right. pretty restricted. Yeah. It's okay. about the website. It's, it's about yeah. the website, yeah. okay. Yeah. Not, not a discussion in a committee member, uh, you know, okay meeting but about the website. I think Council Wagon is next. Yeah, I both on the, on Kathy's point about the permission, I, I'm I also have a reservation about that, even even with regard to the website, because I think that we should notify people that we're looking at their property and that we might be, you know, letting the town people know that that's an area of interest. But 
I, like David, I don't necessarily want to handcuff the ability of the committee to deliberate and share their deliberations with the community at large. So if you're saying, and this was the case in the Conservation Commission, that there might be a, a path, a proposed path that they think looks attractive for the future, for connectivity or whatever, whatever reason, and there's, it goes through seven people's properties. Now, who knows if we'd ever get the permission of those seven people. Over time, we have gotten permission of different people. Um, but I, I want to be conscientious about making sure that they're involved in the process and that we don't step on their toes and wait till later in the process to, to put anything on the website, but to, to withhold the ability to visually see it and just limit it to only written descriptions, I, I think just hampers the public's deliberations on it. And the second point about Facebook, I, I, hopefully we wouldn't have to spend really any tax dollars on this. I'm, I'm sure that we can get somebody to volunteer to set up, and Facebook doesn't cost any money to join. So, and, and my feeling is, is that it's a useful forum to have debate. What we receive is comments from people, their own comments, but they're, they're not debating each other. You, so you might have some robust debate on the, on the Facebook page uh, that makes people think a little more thoroughly and interact with each other. Uh, an old-fashioned democratic way. Okay, Council Wall. I, I, you know, again, thank you for, for taking the time, both of you, to do this. I, I was just curious if we, if we look at the last couple of uh, projects that we've had, whether it was the Library Planning Committee or the Town Center Committee, are there learnings from those two exercises that you could filter through this same format and see if there's something that comes out on the other end? I mean, it's. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, at one level, we're talking about more input, and then we're also suggesting here that there is kind of overkill. Um, and you know, it's kind of interesting when you look at that. It's there's a real balance there. Um, it's great to to take a deep dive and look at something in retrospect now that we've had a chance, a little bit of time. But I just wonder about a couple of our other um, recent um, engagements of town committees. Whether we would take a look at that and see if. We could collapse all three of these into five or six key elements that we would employ in either ordinance change or uh, policy change, whatever. I mean, I, I see the possibility of a workshop maybe here, but but at the same token, I, I look at those other two efforts that went down, and clearly there may be some similarities, but there may be some differences. But I, I just this is a, a great piece of work as sort of a beginning point to kind of retrospectively look at how we do business. And I, I, I applaud that effort, but I also feel like we, we did have some luck on a couple of other committees that, that went in different directions, maybe, man, maybe managed differently, obviously maybe less emotional issues. We weren't talking about people's backyards, but we certainly got involved in vernal pool, pool issues here in the downtown center that, uh, that were either real or imagined. Um, so. I just look at, you know, let's look at some of these other projects as well, as, instead of just taking one in isolation and, and coming up with a, a change in plan or policy. What I'd like to do now is, as every councilor has had one thing to say, is offer our uh, member of the public to speak. I just want, if I could, yeah. no briefly. I, I just wanted to speak to uh, Councilor Ray's comment on permission. When uh, Jamie and Caitlin and I met to, to talk about this, we, we did look at different projects. And one of the projects we looked at was the Shore Road Pathway. And, you know, that was extensively presented on our website. And if we had had to get permission from all of those property owners along Shore Road in order to show their property at all as the potential of the Shore Road Pathway, I think it's safe to say that we probably would not have been up front with the rest of the citizens of the community at knowing what the exact proposal was. And that that's why you know, advance notice, but when we discussed it, we were particularly thinking of the Shore Road Pathway um, to, to, as a requirement to have uh, advanced permission probably is not in keeping with, you know, the, the a responsibilities to the larger community that one citizen could actually insist that the rest of the public not have the right to know something that's proposed, even if it is on their property. Thank you. And now uh, we have a member of the public that would like to comment. You have three minutes. Thank you, Bob Steer, Nine Rockcrest Drive. I was involved in the uh, the uh, controversy uh, last fall professionally. Now I want to 
see if I can provide some of my observations from a personal standpoint, not professional. Um, because I think that this report and looking back at what happened is very important. Um, but it struck me in reading the report that what was most important about what created the controversy was not a lack of notice or not a lack of timelines. It was an inconsistency, I think, in the perception of what the town is doing. And that is, the town is saying, the report says, the town only establishes trails on property for which the town has public access rights. And then, the plan proposes trails on private property where the town clearly does not have public access rights. Now, there's an inconsistency. And I can well understand that people would be upset thinking that the town is making plans for their private property. I don't have any problem with a commission talking about things. But when the town is going to propose I think it should live by what its principles are. And the principles are, look, we're only going to work with property that we already have access to. And it's, what struck me in the report was the sentence on the second page, maps proposing a public use of a private property should not be posted online until proposals are nearing their final stages. Well, I don't think it's a question of timing. I think the problem is that the town should not be proposing a public use of private property, period. And, and that if the town adopted the principle that no trail will be proposed on land unless the town already has public access rights to that land, that that would lend a lot more rationality, and, and uh, remove a lot of controversy from this process. I think that's what is upsetting people, is that they have a sense that the town is making decisions about what's going to happen with their property. And uh, the town certainly recognizes that that's not what it's supposed to do, because it says we're not going to do that. But um, there's an inconsistency. Thank you. Thank you. Any more comments? Council Wagner? I, I just, I guess I don't need Bob, Bob to respond to this, but the, what I'm understanding him to say is that um, essentially to don't propose any more paths because we should wait until private landowners come to us and offer an easement or their land. Uh, but that we need not be in the business of looking to propose additional paths in town. I'm happy to respond. No. Just, no. I'm sorry, we're, we really, we can't have any more comment. We've got a very that, long that's, agenda. That's, that's a logical conclusion that I draw from that. But. Okay, Councilor Jordan. I was just going to say, based on what Bob said, if you just change the, the verbiage from proposed paths to proposed land acquisition rights, I mean, that's essentially what they were doing, is proposing where we're going to get public land, and then we'd put a path through. So it's just a matter of changing the language. The, the proposals are still, you can't put the path on until you get the land right. So if you just change the, the title of the purpose to you know, what we plan to go and get easements or buy land, and then put a trail on it, it's still they had to go through the same process. So at this point, um, we've, we have a motion on the table to receive the report. Um, and uh, is there any more discussion for that? We certainly can receive it, and then after that, oh. we determine we want to have a workshop at a later date, and perhaps ask Council Wagner and Council Jordan or others to, you know, if we want to entertain Council Walsh's suggestion of incorporating some other committee work into some of these concepts. Yeah, I like Jim's suggestion. Yeah, I so let us go ahead. I would just then recommend that we receive the report, vote to receive it, and then we can, uh, if there's consensus uh, on following up, I don't know if we need to vote on that consensus or not. Okay. 
Yeah. What does the council feel? Well, let, let's go ahead and move the question. All those in favor? Receiving the report. Okay. Is there a motion then? As an, it's not on the agenda, but we can go ahead and do this. Do whatever you want. Okay. <laughs> can we entertain a motion? Councilor Sherman, do you have a motion? Uh, I think I do. Um, <laughs> I uh, move that we uh, continue to the discussion about the uh, process uh, of reviewing proposals for ordinances, plans, etc., to a workshop. At which time we would also consider not only the Green Belt and Trail update process, but others such as the Town Center Plan Committee, the Library Building Committee, to see if we can draw lessons from those as well. Okay. Is there a second? Thank you, Councilor Wagner. Second. Any more discussion? I, I'm not sure we I, we didn't talk about when, but I, I would think just when it, we have time. I mean, there, well, I know we've got a lot of right. things in the pipeline, so I would just rely on the chair and the town manager to I, I, come up yeah. with a good time. Before December. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking after, but anyway. Well, <laughs> you don't want to vote on it. Hmm. No. I'm just trying to put no. this a second, but you don't need a second. Oh, I have yes, a second. Jamie did. Jamie did. Um, yeah, I would anticipate maybe September 3rd workshop. But anyway, all those in favor? I, I just wanted to just say one more thing. I, I certainly want to encourage Bob to, I'm not trying to be thick there. I just, that's how I interpret it. If you could send, send us something. Thanks. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay, next item is number 100, Coastal Zone Management Program Grant Application. Uh, I'm going to ask the town manager to introduce this. Yes, I'll introduce it, and, and Maureen is here if you have more detailed questions. Uh, every so often, the, uh, the main department, now known as Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry, used to be the State Planning Office, makes available some funds under the Coastal Zone Management Program, which began in the early 1970s, uh, to look at different issues. And one of the recommendations that's in the uh, 2014 Town Center Plan is to update the 1995 Town Center Stormwater Management Program. The Town Center Stormwater Management Program has actually done a lot of good things. Uh, it it uh, improved a lot of the drainage up along this corridor here. It took developed a stormwater management plan for the school grounds, including some detention basins uh, and some other work. And the plan is in need of updating. We did have a deadline of July 1 to submit an application, and we submitted it with the understanding that if you did not approve the submittal of the application, we would call them tomorrow and withdraw the application. <laughs> so uh, the application has gone in and uh, request that you uh, authorize uh, that action. Does anyone have a question for Mike or for Maureen or to comments? Is there a motion to approve the Coastal Zone Management Program grant application? Council Wall. So moved. A second. Second. Mr. Sherman, any more discussion? I just wanted to say that David, David and I are tickled that there's one of our recommendations from the Town Center Plan that's being implemented. <laughs> <laughs> For batting a thousand. That's good. <laughs> all, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay, item number 101, deadline for review of land use amendments. I'll go ahead and uh, just introduce this item. Um, <clears throat> I've recommended, uh, I recommend that, uh, I'm recommending that the council request the planning board to submit by January 2015 its recommendations on a propose, on proposed amendment to the zoning ordinance arising from the land use chapter of the 2007 Town of Cape Elizabeth Comprehensive Plan. This was most recently given to the Planning Board in February of 2013. Um, you know, we've had dialogue with the Planning Board recently, Councilor uh, Ray, who's Chairman of Ordinance, and myself, to discuss timelines. Um, the Planning Board Chairman has reviewed this recommendation, and she's fine with it. So, any questions? May I have a motion? I move that we um, accept the uh, recommendation um, that you're making of the uh, planning board that they submit to us by January 15th, the recommendation on the proposed amendment to the zoning ordinance arising from the land use chapter in the 2007 comprehensive plan. Thank you. Is there a second? Councilor second. Any, any discussion or questions? I, I'd like to, I applaud both of you 
for taking the lead on this. Um, I think that you know it's important to be proactive and to set some some guidelines. I mean, we've had a few things, not unlike uh, the restaurant issue with the 100 seats taking a lot longer than it needs to take. And we're supposed to be responsive as a local community to our citizens. And I think this this is again another example of you both taking the lead. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Anything else? No. I'm just getting ready for the next one. Okay, that's what I thought. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. T item number 102: Tax Increment Finding Districts Presentation. <clears throat> um, we had uh, asked the town manager to give us a brief presentation on tax increment financing. It is fairly complicated. In advance of the, our other items on the September workshop. We thought it prudent to ask for some information on this. So, if you would, uh, you want to get the back light again? Thank you. Just looking at the town planning committee, another item on your action plan. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks, Jim. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman Sullivan. Uh, the council asked for the, the brief 25 cent overlook of tax increment financing districts. And, and what you'll know, and if you look at the agenda, this is one that I prepared. There's also a much lengthier state one that really gets into the weeds. And I thought it'd be easier just to do one that was, I think, more applicable to Cape Elizabeth and what the proposal is. First of all, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of questions of, you know, what is a TIF or a tax increment finance district? And basically is you identify a certain parcel, group, groups of parcels, a, a certain uh, portion of land, and you basically say that all development that comes after a certain date within up to the next 30 years, uh, that any new new tax revenue from that is set into a, a lockbox, to use an old political term, into, a, into an account that can be used for special purposes, for improvements within that district, or improvements uh, uh, that relate to that district. It, these are governed by main statute, and it's got to be based on a plan, for example, our town center plan. And uh, one real key to it is that this new valuation is not included in the state, state valuation. And I'll explain a couple of slides what the, what the importance of that is. So, you know, if, if you look at uh, this little cartoon, which might be difficult to see up, up top, but it shows someone in a tax office and someone leaving, and the comment is, I'll be needing one of your legs as well. And you know the, the theory. You know the point is is that you know the, the tax collector. Uh, I have the title, although I don't do it. Uh, you know will we'll take your arm and the, and the leg. And really, the point in this is, if you look at new valuation from the state uh, in in the town, is that the state through school subsidy and through uh, the county tax really begins to take an arm and a leg <coughs> before the town gets the full value from the potential of uh, the revenue. So let's assume, in the, say this was in the town center, if there was $4 million in new value, new development, that the assessor went up and said, yep, we got $4 million here. And this wouldn't be immediate, it could be over time, but let's say it was in place the whole 10 years. Uh, that would provide 67200 in taxes based on this year's tax rate. Over 10 years, if it was in place the whole 10 years, it'd be about $672,000, so you know, quite a bit of money. But what, what happens is, you know, you add that extra revenue, they take away school subsidy, the county tax goes up, and, you know, there's lots of estimates out there. So I showed you the full range. I didn't want to promise the sky, I didn't want to promise the, the floor. But, so the range is 30 to 70 percent. So basically, you know, if you, you take both of those, and you take the 67,200, uh, you know, the town doesn't get to keep that money. On the low end, 20,000 of it goes to uh, state funding reductions and higher county taxes. And on the higher end, it's 47,000. So even though you think you're taking 672,000 in in taxes, the state's going to take by, by policy, either by reducing our school subsidy or by giving, raising our county tax, between 200,000 and 470,000 of that 4 million in, in new valuation. So, you know, it's a, it's, it's not the, the big gain you think it is when you, when you look at new tax revenues. It's going to be the same for, for anything, except the TIF gives you the opportunity to actually avoid the impact on state valuation. That's, that's the difference. There's some fine print with any rules. You couldn't build a, you know, a new town hall or you know, redo the council chamber. Uh, you can't use it for public recreational purposes. Uh, 
which is interesting. We couldn't build a playground with it. Uh, but it can be used for architectural fees, engineering fees, construction of infrastructure, and it can also be used outside the district for, you know, if you wanted to extend a sewer line or, or gas line or, or something like that in order to, to get something positive happening in the district. You can do that, you, you don't have to. There's been a lot of discussion about the TIF proposal in the town center, and a lot of it in, is gains a life of its own like so many other issues. And I want to underline that full first bullet. I should have put it in, in uh, a thousand font size. This, the town center TIF proposal is not related to any specific development. The, t the, the proposal that's coming out of the town center committee is not what they call one that you help out the developers with. It's not intended to give developers a tax break. It, as proposed, as discussed, it wouldn't give a tax break. It would simply give the town a pool of money to be able to spend to be able to spend in in the particular district. That's it. There's no benefit from develop, developers unless you think that because you know maybe they get some benefit we put in a sidewalk or whatever that eventually their land we can debate that. But we're not giving them tax breaks. That's what they do in TIFs and other communities. There's been no suggestion that I have heard that that's proposed for Cape Elizabeth. The town center TIF proposal suggested to pay for stormwater management, sidewalk additions, and sidewalk improvements to improve pedestrian safety. I don't know how many committees have told us to put flags out at the crosswalks, to add more crosswalks, to add the flashing stop. You know, instead of having everyone's taxpayers' dollars paid for that, if we had had a TIF in place, the TIF could have paid for, uh, for example, the, the new painted crosswalks, the new, uh, the new uh, flashing, you know, pedestrian signs, all those things. And the other sidewalks that people say they want in the town center, that is, is talk about putting one from the high school down to, down to Fowler Road. Seems like a reasonable idea. You know, there's already, Seasmark is going to do one. But, you know, this would put a sidewalk, uh, you know, potentially a, along that section. I mean, that's totally keeping with committee after committee's recommended that. I, and, you know, if you look at what, the recommendations come forward of sidewalks and related drainage, it's 1.7 million. You know, that's going to have to come out of everyone's tax dollars, of which we need to send 30 to 70 percent of it to the state. If you had a TIF, you, you could potentially do that without sending it all to the state and, and help to fill some of the gap toward the 1.7 million. Obviously, the numbers in the best scenarios only give 670,000 over 10 years, which is, you know, about a third of that. We also, you know, well, what about other monies? Do we have other monies? Yeah, we have this infrastructure improvement fund, which is, is uh, three, three, three uh, tenths of one percent of any building permit, and that has uh, about 136,000 in that account. And is we had given a loan from that for the library of 100,000, so they actually be up to 236. So it, it does money. Uh, what about timing? You know, if the council, you know, there's a March one deadline every every year for. In order to apply for the state to to allow a TIF, you know, you, you apply once, uh, it's it's then renewed, but you have to apply uh, by March one. Uh, the, if we applied by March one of 2015, they they sort of reach back and they look at all the evaluations since 331 2014, and some would say, you know, Mike, you're crazy. There's not going to be four million dollars in new valuation here in the town center. Well, you know, we we already have banked. If, if you adopted this 650,000, which Matt Sturgis gave me as the as the new value from the the new Cumberland Farms, from the Sea Salt Market that's going to be opening very soon, next to the uh, high school driveway, and from Jen DeSena's real estate office over here, uh, you know, just a little bit of work down there. So you know, a few other things happen. The Cumberland Farms gets redeveloped. Maybe Paul Woods will eventually do something next door. You know, hold our breath. Uh, you know, we'll see. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, uh, it, it's just potential uh, for doing that. Uh, you know, we, we talk about how much of an area of town is this that would be potentially developed. You know, this is sort of, it's 144 acres, but if you notice, that includes all the school grounds. We don't tax the school grounds. So it's, a, it's actually a very little bit of an area. You know, there's, there's the Murray lot next door, across the street could be potentially developed. There's talk about uh, Peter Heffenreffer doing something here. That land's on the market. Paul Wood's lot here. Uh, the, the, the bank, you know, it, it could be the shopping center could have some evaluation, depending on what they do in the long run. So this, this is the, the potential district. Again, it's, uh, 
you know, 1% of the area town, but again, if you take out the schools, we're talking, you know, maybe a third of 1%, maybe. Uh, so the summary of the key points, the shelter's new tax revenue from a set area, so the town doesn't need to send an arm and a leg of the new revenue to the state and to the county. It would help fund pedestrian improvements, stormwater management, and again, I want to underline, it's not related to any specific development. It's sort of, this thing sort of got caught up with whatever, you know, the talk was next door, and I, I'm not sure how that happened. Uh, but, you know, there's no individual that I can see uh, benefit that uh, accrues to any, to any one proposal. So, anyway, I think you asked for, you know, again, I said, you know, the nickel review, 25 cent review of TIFFs, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. And again, I, I also commend to you the longer presentation for anyone watching that are links are online with the agenda and at the council packet website for this meeting that they can look at whole pages and pages about TIFFs. Any questions for Mike? Councilor so Jordan? So I'm wondering, the, we're going to drop the other foot. <laughs> the only downside I see is that. The new valuation is not going into the regular, the, the town-wide revenue, so taxes won't go down any for other people be, based on the new valuation. Is there any other downside to a TIF? Yeah, the, uh, thank you, Caitlin. There's, uh, you, know, you know, some might argue, well, you know, the monies aren't being fully, you know, the schools aren't getting 70% of the new tax rate because they get 70% of the taxes. We might have, you know, someone might advance that argument. But I think if we look at the one town concept, you know, we ought to be looking at the benefit to the overall taxpayers. And if we're going to be doing most of this work anyway, shouldn't we do it getting 100% of the, the benefit of the dollar and not, and not losing 30 to 70% of it? So that, 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 would be, right. that would be one argument that would, would probably be out there. You know, the other is there's a little bit of administrative burden. Uh, you know, but it's initially the first time. Uh, and, you know, and, you know, I think the, the only other thing, you know, does it open the door to other TIFs? Yeah, I don't know. I doubt that it would, uh, you know, in this community. Uh, you know, but that's, that's essentially it. I think, you know, and, and you obviously, you know, you point out it's, it's dedicated monies. It's dedicated to a certain fund, and it, it isn't available uh, for, you know, for, for use elsewhere in the community. Councilor Sherman? Uh, I'm trying to figure out the, the, the timing issue if we did want to take advantage of the increase in valuation from March 31st of 2014. Uh, we need to submit the application by, was it April 1st of 2015? I have one final slide. Okay, so that's, that's so you're, you're anticipating my question is how much lead time, because I assume it's staff to prepare such an application, so if the council were interested in doing this, how much lead time do you think the staff would need to prepare the application so we submit it on time? You know, the, the suggestion is, is that you have some discussion, uh, further explanation of the TIF district, that you ask us to develop a TIF application, if you ask that this evening, we'd begin doing that. Uh, and then you have a public hearing in September. You know, my preference would be that we have that TIF application ready for September so that the public actually knows what's in the application. Unlike the Postal Zone Manager, and we just did after the fact, this one is, you know, I'd, I'd want them to see all, everything in the, the application and to know about it. Yeah, it doesn't have to happen in September, but at the, at the same time, we have an election in November. It's just, you know, it, it just the closer, you know, you, I don't know how many changes there are going to be here. I hear you'll, you may be leaving, David, uh, but, uh, yeah, that, that's the reason for September, is so that we, we you know, we could delay it to last the first of the year, but if you're ready to do it, there doesn't seem to be a reason to do it. Council Walsh. Uh, Michael, if, if, um, if this is, um, in many ways, this, the downside, I appreciate having, having that illustration, especially as it relates to 70% of the, the school dollars that wouldn't be available. Um, why haven't we done it before? You know, there's, I've never been a big fan of TIFFs, so I've never brought together a proposal. We've never had a committee bring together a proposal. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think most of the TIFFs that have been done in other areas have been with, you know, they've sort of, they're generally requested by the business sector to personally benefit a specific business proposal. Uh, you know, those types of TIFFs probably never would have been welcomed in this community. Uh, I think we've seen the examples of, for example, Falmouth 
has protected uh, 30 million dollars or so, I think. Hmm? In valuation. Hmm? Over 40 million dollars in valuation because Falmouth has taken advantage of it. We're paying more county tax. Uh, you know, they have sheltered that, and uh, you know, we, we, we're we're not doing as well. Uh, you know, it's it would be a different philosophy philosophical thing, but more and more communities have done them, uh, and it has to become more simple, you know, you, you, you got to look at, you know, what's the legal cost to develop them, what are some of those issues. The fact we would be doing a TIF that isn't, that isn't a, a credit enhancement, is that what they call it? A credit enhancement TIF, uh, the, the legal issues go away, they're a lot less complicated, it's a, it's a fairly standard agreement, so this could be done my guess, you know, our, our entire expense to set this up, uh, you know, legal fees or whatever would be a couple thousand dollars uh, at most. Okay. Thank you. Two questions. One, uh, your slide said it can go up to 30 years. Yep. Do we have to predetermine the amount of years that we do it and then can you use the monies as they're coming in or do you have to wait till the end of the time you, that you determined? You, you, uh, let me, uh, uh, you have about two or three options. You can, you can, first of all, the, the last part, use the money whenever you want to use it. As soon as it's in-house, you can use it. There, there's, there's no delay required. Second, it's up to 30 years. You can apply for, to, to have this in place for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. The option is totally up to you what you do. You can also, you have an option of, you don't have to put 100% of the uh, new additional tax valuation into the TIF. You can say, we only want to do 50% of it. We only want to do 70% of it. So that's another option that you also have. Do you have to determine that all up front, or can you do it year by year? You, you, de you should be determining that up front. OK. My other question was, you made a comment that you've never been a big fan of TIFs. Yeah. Why? Uh, you know, I've always looked at the community. And, you know, I've always looked at this and, as sort of a pro-development thing. And I've just never got a strong feeling this community was pro-development in, in many different respects. But I think as we've seen other communities use them, you know, it's, it's well worth looking at. And, you know, and I respect the deliberations of municipal committees. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, Abe Lincoln said I'll adopt new views when they appear to be true views. And, uh, you know, it was, this was a committee that recommended this and, uh, you know, if that's what the community wants to do, it's fine with me. Yeah, I mean, and I do think that the committee's intention was not, as you've emphasized a couple of times, to de uh, benefit a particular business development. It was more sidewalks, stormwater management, sort of infrastructure uh, that would address recommendations that numerous other committees have made concerning, for example, pedestrian safety in the town center. So I, I, I think that was way the the focus of the Town Center Plan Committee in recommending we proceed with the TIF. And I think, you know, for those citizens that are all upset about, you know, something that may or may not happen next door, you know, this, you know, I, I, I met with Peter Hafenreffer a couple weeks ago, and I asked him specifically, when he was meeting with Steve Morris himself, I said, you know we're proposing this, and you know we're not proposing this to particularly benefit your development. You do know that. Oh, yeah, we don't have that expectation at all. So I'm not even sure where that whole, that whole thing's coming from, that somehow it was tied to whatever, whatever they wanted to do next door. Council Wagner? Yeah, I mean, I just want to echo what Mike said. It couldn't be more clear from our deliberations that there was absolutely no connection between the two. That proposed, that's a separate landowner's uh, proposed development. And the TIF concept, I think, where people get hung up on it is that Typically, you think about big cities bringing ballparks in and not having to pay taxes forever. Or some, or I think it was used in, in Portland for Pure Sapley. I think they had a tip, you know, so they could develop on the, on the waterfront. So bigger cities typically do use it to encourage a specific development, but that is not what we're doing at all. It's what David said. Is we're talking about sidewalks, you know, which are going to come out of the public treasury anyway if we approve them. So I, I think that, you know, to the school advocates, of which I'm one, it, if we can shelter more money, then we'll ultimately, we're going to have more money to, to pay for the schools, you know, so it's just tax savings. We're, we're going to have more money in our public treasury because we won't have to spend it 
on these sidewalks that we're going to have to allocate money to ultimately. And, and it's very likely that some of the stormwater management monies that are spent are going to be benefiting the school department. It would be, I'd be very surprised if it didn't. Council Wall. Yeah, um, it, it's, the TIF wouldn't um, provide to the developer, the potential developer, uh, the ability to negotiate out from any off-site improvements that might be expected of them. Is that, is that true? So as an example, when we were planning to do this building next door, it was $2.4 million. And the off-site improvements that were going to be required of us, even though we never got that far, were sidewalks across the front of the property. So by having a tip, which would effectively be putting dollars away for sidewalks, in this case, the developer would still have to go through planning board approval and more than likely be required to provide the off-site improvements. Yeah. It, it's my expectation that the town would continue its traditional role of the expectation that the developer would pay for those improvements on their property. And, and I would, you know, you, you may call it off-site if it's in the right-of-way. Uh, you know, to us, that's, that's you know, Seas Market was just required to put in a sidewalk. Rudy's was just required to put in a sidewalk. Uh, you know, Cumberland Farms, for instance, there's a sidewalk in front of that property as well. And yeah. all those were paid for by, by uh, the folks that Thank developed you. or redeveloped those properties. Thank you. Councilor Jordan. I was just going to say, it seems to be a unique opportunity where we've had so much development given in the last year that it might be a good idea. Even if you limit it to one or two years, not 30, it seems like a good chunk of change that we could grab. Yeah. I've got a question that um, no, wait, just on that point. You know, if we didn't, if you didn't do this, we're sort of kissing twenty thousand dollars goodbye. Well, that's with what, what I'm saying. We already have banked. Yeah. Right. Just because of the timing of all the development. I mean, not much gets developed here in Cape Elizabeth. <laughs> when it happens, but, really yeah, it forward. seems to have been this it. one year. We have an opportunity to really capture and and do something with the money. Um, I know uh, we've talked about this before, but. Um, the, the concept of a TIF actually benefiting uh, the school department if the valuation of Cape Elizabeth is lower as a result of keeping that added valuation here in town and it doesn't go to Augusta, would it then increase the school um, funding from Augusta? Exactly. That's what it does. Right. You know, the, the, my, I don't know the exact percentage how it breaks down, but you know, my guess is it's 85% of the benefit would accrue on the school subsidy side and about 15% on the county tax side. Thank you very much. Any more questions for Mike? This so if, if I don't hear an objection, it would be our intent to uh, have an application for you uh, for a public hearing in September. I think that makes sense. Uh, I, you know, I don't know in terms of the duration of the TIF. Um, I mean, it would seem to me at least 10 to 15 years. And I assume if you did something that long, if it's going well after 15 <coughs> years, you could, I assume we could reapply and just. De depending on those state laws in effect at that given time. Right. Yeah. Um, but uh, hmm. anyway, I, I, I suppose we don't have to decide that tonight, but I, yeah. I, I would want the the number of years to be long enough to develop some. Yeah, my recommendation, if you do do it, you do it for at least 15 years, yeah. simply because, you know, you, this, this ought to be based on a capital improvement plan as well of what are your priorities, what do you plan to do, and it's, it's nice to know. You, you know, you don't know exactly what new valuation is going to be, but at the same time that you, uh, you, you sort of the big picture of, of what's coming down the road. So what is the consensus? Do you need a motion? I think I need a motion, yes. Actually, Council Chairman, do you have any motion? Sure, I, I move that we request town staff to develop a TIF application uh, and that we would set the application for a public hearing in September. Your second? Council Wagner, any more discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you, Mike. Um, and you have the next item as well, item 103, five-year financial forecast. Uh, the town manager has prepared a five-year financial forecast and will briefly highlight the report. 
I got to figure out how to tilt the sideways. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Rotate right. You. <laughs> Clockwise. Oh, clockwise. Okay, good. In full screen. Hmm? What's that? Well, I don't want that. There we go. Uh, during some of the discussion, uh, am I? Did you recognize me? Yes. I'm, okay. Yes, I'm good. certainly recognizing you. Thank you. <laughs> and it, it, I'm sorry. Who made the motions on the last one? I, I forgot I was uh, clerk there for a second. Councilor so Sherman uh, moved. Sherman and Wagner. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Now your manager and you uh, clerk. Were in the two hats. Yep. Uh, during the finance committee discussion, I believe there was there was discussion that we ought to have a five-year financial forecast when we look at expenditures and we look at revenues. And first, I'd like to thank Sarah Beard Buckley for this wonderful photo uh, that she uh, actually did for the Arboretum. And, uh, you know, just a beautiful sight. And I, I wish I could get this full screen, but uh, it doesn't seem to be wanting to cooperate with me. Uh, but anyway, uh, so it, this is, I apologize, it's really tough to read this. And uh, let me... Uh, Anyway, it, I think you might have the, the, uh, the paper with you. Uh, but what we did is we looked at the uh, different expenditure assumptions and we looked at our revenue assumptions. And, you know, th this is for the next five-year period. And we, we, this, th these numbers are based on the assumption that the Thomas Memorial Library referendum will be approved. It'll be $4 million. We'll borrow the money next July. Uh, and that we'd, we'd pay, some of it would hit the next fiscal year, 16, and some of it would hit on 17. Secondly, that inflation uh, overall would be 2.5% per year over the five years. Uh, employee benefits, we keep particularly seeing the retirement, that old debt keeps growing. So that's, you know, we, we pessimistic there, 5% per year. Uh, that there'd be no additional debt service that we borrowed over the five-year period. And that the capital budget that would we'd only increase at 50,000 this next year, instead of the 100,000 we have been doing because of the library also coming, coming on deck in order to, to mitigate the increase. Uh, we looked at revenue increases, uh, excise tax revenue will continue to grow, people buying newer cars, uh, there'll be uh, about a 1% growth in valuation every year as a result of new construction. Uh, the state government income will be flat, who knows. Uh, we, we're seeing cable television revenues go down. We think that will continue as people look at other options. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if regulatory, sometime we lose that 150,000 revenue, but we're projecting in this, it goes down 20%. Uh, that we're, we're going to, it's proposed to increase recycling, the rates at the recycling center by a couple of percentage points uh, over the, each year on average. And uh, that all other revenues will be flat for the period. Uh, if, so if, if you look at this, this whole thing, uh, it, the, the five-year projection shows that taxes for municipal services would increase 40 cents total over the next five years. That includes the library, it includes all these assumptions. And just to, to put that in perspective, the school increase in this year's budget alone was 49 cents. So to do the new library, to do, uh, you know, 2.5% inflation every year, and all these other projections, it's the, the municipal tax rate would increase less over the next five years in total than the school budget did uh, this, this one year. One year. Uh, it would add about $120 to the average tax bill total over so the next five years. In other words, the tax bill for someone would be $120 more five years from now than it is today. And then we went through, and I know you can't see this, but you, anyone online can see it, is, you know, we looked at the different departments. We, it shows what the inflation hits, where it hits, you know, based on those assumptions. And we looked at the revenues, and this shows the, uh, the tax increases uh, each, each year based on these assumptions. And what, what it shows is that uh, next year there'd be a 3.6% spend tax increase on the municipal budget 4.4, 2.2, 2.6, 2.6, and then 0 0.8. Uh, but when you actually look at the tax rates on that uh, and you look at the overall budget, uh, you know, which is at the bottom of this last sheet, 
it shows that overall next year would be 13 cents increase or 0.8% uh, of the overall tax bill. The, the year the library really hits, it would be 19 cents or 1.2%, and then it's about half of 1% the next three years. And if you add that all together, it goes, the tax bill, as I said, goes to 354 per thousand to 394 five years from now. Uh, so that's the, the big picture of where we're looking. You know, it, it, there are certain assumptions that it's based on, but you know, we, we have never really done a five-year financial forecast. We've looked at capital improvement plans, but we've never looked at all the departments, all of the budgets. And you know, it's, it'll be a work in progress, but uh, I think it was an interesting exercise to do, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Questions? No? Well, thank you. Um, I, think, I think that uh, you know, going forward, this is going to be a very useful tool because we can refer back to it as we go through our budget deliberations, you know, starting in the early winter. Um, you know, I think it's always an excellent idea to, to try to forecast what you're going to be taking in and what you're going to be spending. Um, and uh, so I, I'm very, very pleased. And we can, re you know, I think, you know, as, as we go along, we'll review this. We may adjust some of the assumptions and maybe, uh, you know, Jim can help us with that as, you know, 2014 progresses and we see what, what might be changing in the projections that Mike's making and that'll help us next, next winter when we start our fiscal year 16's budget. So, thank you very much. And uh, item number one, uh, 100. 104 proposed revised carry forward balances. The town manager has revised proposed carry forward balance approved on June 12, 2014, based on actual balances on June 30, 2014. So I'll ask the town manager to uh, uh, introduce this as well. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have on this. Uh, as you can see, some of them were revised once we actually looked at the balances on on uh, July 2nd, uh, most of them revised downward as some of the amounts were spent. And happy to answer any questions you may have. Does anyone have any questions? I just say the, the one addition was the 17825 for uh, uh, the, 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 the bond refinancing fees and expenses. When we did that refinancing, we, we get back what they call a premium of 39000 that was intended to pay for all of the different fees for bond council and for Moody's and S&P and all those that end at 17825 is what was left after we paid Moody's, S&P, one of the lawyers, and uh, the uh, financial advisors fee. We still got to pay the bond council fee, which will probably eat a lot of this. All right. Jessica. Any questions? Councilor Jordan? I just had a question about the police cruiser replacement, how it went from 28000 to 22000 Yep. It, it just happened that between when we put the numbers together in early June, uh, a new cruiser had come in that we had paid for the cruiser, but we hadn't paid for the striping and the painting and all of that stuff, and the bills came in for, for all that. I was just hoping we got a cruiser for 6000 <laughs> Yeah. You know, if, if anyone's, all of the cruisers that are now regularly on the road, the marked cruisers are all the, the uh, SUVs now. Yep. Let everyone be aware. Anyone else? Do I have a motion to accept the proposed revised carry forward balances? Council Wall? So moved. Second. Council Ray? Second. Any more discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Item number 105, draft policy for email notifications. The town manager has prepared a draft policy for email notifications. This is actually, as I'm sure you all remember, a follow-up to uh, one of our town council goals. So uh, I'll let uh, Mike go ahead and, and uh, introduce this again. I'm sure everyone has seen his draft proposal. Yeah, this is, the council asked us to look into a mechanism for actually being able to get people's email addresses and to be able to send stuff to folks. But anyway, I worked with Wendy Derzewick, our uh, webmaster on this. And, uh, there's, there's something called MailChimp. It's actually already being used by the library. And the, the real advantage of this is people can give us their email addresses 
and they're not public. This was a as a result of a change in uh, main law so that they don't have to worry about anyone could call us and get copies of all the, the different emails addressed. We wouldn't have them. They'd be kept by this outfit uh, called MailChimp. Again, it's an independent service provider. Uh, it, this indicates this policy that they'd be attained for the sole purpose of providing non-interactive communications. This is right out of the, the state law. Uh, to citizens and other interested parties should be kept confidential and shall not be considered a public record. That's the exact wording of the state law. The message content, though, anything we send is a public record. It's just the email addresses that aren't. Uh, this would, they would need to be kept non-political without opinions. The types of notice to send out would be such things as election process notifications, absentee and voting day procedures, election results, notices of public hearings, notices of special community events, you know, 250th anniversary, family fund day, whatever it is, you know, snow closings, road repair notifications, emergency public safety notices. Uh, you know, and there'd be a special password, hopefully it wouldn't be hacked, and, uh, you know, that it would be very limited who could actually send out notifications. Because one thing is if we establish this, and like anything, you know, you, you get <coughs> sent out too many and then no one pays any attention to any of them. So uh, we want to make sure two things. One is that we, we don't overuse the system so that people see the, the value and the worth of it. And second is that, uh, you know, we, we really try to stay non-political, try not to be trying to persuade people of the rightness or wrongness of something. For example, on the, the library issue, you know, we would simply send to them, uh, you know, that you're going to be voting on the library. This is the vote, uh, and maybe a link to, you know, a proposal. But we're not going to say we're not going to say why it's needed. We're not going to, you know, none of that stuff. Okay. Any questions, Dr. Jordan? This would just be one like master list, and you would get all notifications. You wouldn't so much be able to sign up for it. Library notifications or yeah. budget notifications. You know, the library already uses this. Uh, you know, initially we would just have one uniform system, but you know, we could come back to you at some point if you know we, after piloting this, if uh, if you know people do want to opt into certain types, you know, that's that's possible. Mr. Sherman. Yeah, I remember looking at this five or so years ago, and there are some towns where you sign up for certain types of notifications. And I, I get an RSS feed for all meeting notices. I don't know why I signed up for this, because I get meeting notices for every commission. But it, you know, it comes out almost every day, and then I can double check my calendar. Um, so maybe down the road, we would do that sort of menu mm -hmm. idea that Caitlin alluded to. Yeah, we, we already do. You know, people already can use the RSS feeds, but it, that hasn't been closely followed, and that's only what we really post. On the website. On the website. Yeah, this, right. this, you know, really, you need to, you know, other than the, I told the council, I told the department heads that they could not opt in a route they were opting in, uh, because they need to know what's going on and wanted to see. I said, and the council's gonna initially be set up that way, although if you wanted to ask, but with, with, you can unsubscribe whenever you want, but we're, we're adding the council as a subscriber up front if we implement this. And will there be some public notice that this is yeah, going to sign up? Yeah, uh, Wendy's going to do a news story on it. And, you know, but before we did that, we wanted to make sure a policy was in place so that you know, people don't fear that they're going to get a lot of junk from us and uh, that you, you know, establish the guidelines of really what it was to be used for and not to be used for. And there's no cost to it other than you know, personnel time initially to set it up and to promote it. Uh, you know, as long as you don't get over, you know, so much, so many emails a month or something, there's, there's no cost to it. It's some, it's advertiser supported somehow. Do you think it's possible that we have enough notice ourselves that we could send out one notice a month that included all notices? You know, like these are the three things that are happening this month. So that's people aren't receiving three, four emails a month. I'm just, you know, I, you know, I wouldn't want to be limited to that, but it would be my hope that we, we could do that. You know, for example, when I discussed it with the chiefs, you know, there are examples where, you know, something is happening and, you know, we just, we want to send out, you know, a public notice that, you know, that we're evacuating uh, the town hall. That's different. <laughs> I'm just, or, or that, yeah. you know, so, yeah, but generally it would be good. 
you know, we, we, we don't want, if we send out too much junk, people are going to ignore it. Like, right. you know, if I get one more email a day from Stonewall Kitchen or whatever it is. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> Do, does the school use this technology now for school clothes? The I'm not sure if the schools themselves do, but the 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 parent association use something very. They have something very similar. I know they do use. I'm not sure if they use Mailchimp or they use Constant Contact. Or, yeah, I'd much prefer to have email communication with the school about those things. Fantastic. Yeah. But I think they, don't they do something? Don't you get an email? Mm -hmm. Get a phone call at four in the morning. Yeah. Oh, is that what it is? Well, that happened once. Yeah. yeah. But by non interacting, I mean, it's just notice they can't respond to that email. My wife gets it. Too. Yes. And that's, that's the state law non interacting. Yeah. Uh, the only other thought I have is about the uh, some people get very concerned about like, you know, having CC lists. And maybe I know that this is inherent in what you're saying. But to highlight that this will be all PCC, there's no way to access right. the people's email addresses. That's correct. Yeah. Yep. Any other questions? Mr. Sherman? Oh, do you I want a motion? I'd love it. <laughs> okay. I move that we approve the draft policy for non interactive <laughs> notifications, updates, and cancellations as set forth in our materials tonight. Second. Councilor Jordan, second. Any more discussion? All those in favor? It's approved. Item number 106, updated resolution with TD Bank. Um, we have a new business manager, and he needs to be on the, be able to sign checks. That's what <laughs> That's this one might like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just the banks require us to have all new resolutions that don't say anything different than the other, except adding a person. We also got to, we have some accounts at People's United, and they've asked for the same thing, so if we could also be authorized to do that one, that would be good. For TD Bank and People United. So we would. So a motion would need to say updating resolution with TD Bank and People's United. And People's United. Okay. Any questions? Uh, is there a motion? Can I just say so moved? Yeah. So moved to the modification of adding People. Yeah. United. The other People's, People's Heritage. United. Mm -hmm. United. United. Oh, United. Okay. Is there a second? People's United. Council Wagner. Any more discussion? All those in favor. It's and now, it's an opportunity for citizens to discuss, to discuss items not on the agenda. There are no citizens present. So item number 107, uh, we will be receiving an update on collective bargaining negotiations with the Teamsters uh, representing Public Works employees. And I need a motion to enter into an executive session to discuss the status of collective bargaining. Councilor Sherman? Uh, I move that we enter into executive session to discuss the status of collecting collective bargaining for a successor agreement with Local 340 of the Teamsters representing public work staff pursuant to one Title I Maine Revised Statute, Section 4056D. Is there a second? Council Wagner? Any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. It's can we? Can we? Go off there. Yeah. We won't be returning to the public session. Yeah.